8. Zombie Foot A mother of five who claims to have been attacked by the UK's most poisonous spider while in the hospital is thinking about having her leg amputated. In 2017, just days after a false widow bit her twice, 41-year-old Gemma Hunter's foot swelled up, leaving her in excruciating pain. She suffered from cellulitis, a condition related to meningitis, in an inch-long hole in her right foot that was caused by the bite. The wound was still open eight months later, and as a result, Gemma lost her employment and received a notice to vacate her residence. The only poisonous spider indigenous to England is the false widow, a relative of the deadly black widow. Its bite generally resembles bee or wasp stings. Gemma has reported that the entire ordeal really messed her life up, from losing her job as a school crossing guard to losing her home, on top of her health being in danger. She also claims the bite has landed her in financial debt, which has never been an issue for her before. Gemma was bitten in September 2017 after spending roughly a week at the bedside of her ill son in the Royal Blackburn Hospital. She was sitting next to him, keeping an eye on him after being admitted with terrible chest pains. Then, Gemma said she fell asleep laying next to her son's bedside with her foot propped on a chair. Earlier in the day, she had opened a window to let a breeze in. She woke up in the middle of the night and noticed the spider on her foot. She said she'd seen it before but considered it harmless and thought nothing of it. At first, she shook her foot to get it to come off. When that didn't work, she tried to brush it off with her hand, which is when she was bitten twice. Gemma from Rossendale Borough in Lancashire, UK, has since contemplated asking doctors to amputate her zombie foot because all she wants is to return to normal life. 7. A Horrible Realization At the University Community Hospital in Tampa, Florida, 52-year-old Willie King underwent surgery to amputate one of his legs in 1995. The nurse in the operating room, who was reading King's file, started to tremble and weep as Dr. Rolando R. Sanchez cut through King's leg. And it was at this moment that the doctor came to realize that he had started amputating the wrong appendage. And unfortunately, he concluded that it was too late to undo the damage that had already been done. According to Dr. Sanchez, he mistakenly thought he was amputating the right limb due to King's disease length condition and an oversight by other medical staff. He further claimed that the wrong leg had already been sanitized and prepared for surgery by the time he reached the operating room. Before this incident, one of Dr. Sanchez's patients complained that the doctor had wrongfully cut off her toe while performing an operation to remove sick tissue from her foot. In the end, the doctor was fined and he received a two-year suspension of his medical license. Additionally, King received a payment of $900,000 from the hospital, as well as a settlement of $250,000 from the surgeon himself. 6. Pancuronium Pandemonium Dialysis was necessary for 79-year-old Richard Smith because of his renal condition. Smith first noticed his shortness of breath in 2010 while he was receiving one of his treatments. As a result, he was admitted to the ICU at North Shore Medical Center in Miami, Florida. The following day, one of his nurses gave him an antacid because he'd stated he had a stomach ache. But unfortunately, it wasn't a pill for stomach relief at all. Instead, the nurse had given him a paralytic and muscle relaxant known as pancuronium. It can be used to induce skeletal muscle relaxation during anesthesia for intubation if given a small dose. It's also the drug given to those receiving the death penalty. In the three-step process, it's the first step as it causes muscle paralysis and respiratory arrest. And so, sadly, Smith became unresponsive after being given the wrong drug. The mix-up was caused by the similarity between the packaging of the antacid and that of the paralytic. Although doctors were able to resuscitate Smith, he remained in a vegetative state until his death one month later due to his lack of brain activity. The Smith family, along with their lawyer, were left confused as to how this sort of thing could have happened. Nurses are typically required to follow a number of steps before administering medications to a patient, and by giving the wrong one, all these procedures must have been disregarded. 
Andrew Yaffa, the family lawyer, claimed that the nurse didn't even look at his chart to see what he was supposed to be taking and didn't match his ID bracelet with the medication she gave him. To make matters even worse, the nurse continued to work on that same floor. She was fined $2,800 and was forced to go through training again, but afterward she was sent right back to work, according to a source. Since then, they've restricted access to pancuronium to anesthesiologists and have taken it out of every hospital nurse's station. So, hopefully this incident won't repeat itself in the future. 5. Hospital Acquired Infection Nine-year-old Alyssa Hemmelgaard became sick on a ski trip with her family in 2007. She developed sores that weren't healing and had swollen glands that were painful. Carol, Alyssa's mother, assumed that because of the symptoms her daughter was showing, it was mono. But unfortunately, things were worse than the family knew. Alyssa ended up being admitted to a hospital in Denver. It was there that she received a diagnosis that's every parent's worst nightmare – leukemia. A child being diagnosed with cancer is devastating by itself. Surprisingly, though, it isn't what claimed young Alyssa's life. The child appeared to be improving after receiving treatment for a week. Alyssa was able to move around the hospital with her mother and see a movie. But as night fell, her condition became increasingly worse. She soon started to have terrible symptoms. Doctors tried everything, but they couldn't save Alyssa and she passed away shortly after. The real culprit, however, was a hospital-acquired illness called Clostridium difficile, C. diff, which had become worse with every passing day Alyssa spent in the medical facility. Before Alyssa passed away, no one had been able to identify the illness she was suffering from. The young girl was given antivan after a doctor diagnosed her as anxious, which may have concealed her symptoms. The cost of treating serious illnesses like C. diff was another reason why nothing was done. Many doctors are hesitant to utilize antibiotics administered directly into a large vein through an IV unless it's absolutely required because of the $50,000 expense. The hospital, according to Alyssa's mother, has subsequently implemented substantial improvements, including new protocols, child-specific early warning systems, a fast response line, and teams that can be called in by a patient's loved ones. 4. Botched Surgery Retired barber Stanwood Elkus underwent prostate surgery in Newport Beach, California in the early 1990s. On January 27, 2013, Elkus mentioned to a friend that urologist Dr. Ronald Gilbert had messed up the procedure and worsened his incontinence. The next day, Elkus arrived for an appointment with the doctor, but the former barber used a fake identity to book the medical meeting. Elkus then fired nine shots into the urologist's body as he entered the examination room, ending his life immediately. Afterward, Elkus left the room and declared to everyone in the medical practice that he'd gone crazy and that the police should be called. He then waited in the building until the cops arrived. Within eight minutes, the police showed up and arrested him. Elkus received a life sentence in prison plus an additional 10 years because of the allegation of lying in wait. In a tragic turn of events, the shooting was a case of mistaken identification. There were no records of Gilbert being present for Elkis's prostate procedure, despite the fact that the man had been employed at the hospital at the time. He'd only assisted a team of doctors with Elkis's initial diagnosis of urethral stricture, but hadn't been responsible for the botched procedure. Elkus used his insanity as a defense to the first-degree murder charge that was brought against him, but the jury found that he was in the right state of mind at the time of the murder. A lawyer for the Gilbert family further proved that Elkus started organizing his affairs the week before the shooting and was aware of the ramifications of his choices. 3. Malpractice When Jan Lemon was taken into the emergency room in 1978 with a broken nose, Milwaukee plastic surgeon Glenn Tucker was there to help. She required emergency surgery, so Tucker gave Miss Lehrman paid medicine and got her ready for the operation. But unfortunately, he didn't give her nose the time it needed for the swelling to go down, and as a result, Lehrman woke up in agony. Following the surgery, Lehrman visited Tucker every single week for two months. Eventually, she had a second surgery, which wasn't helpful, 
as she complained more and more of not being able to breathe. She went to visit Tucker yet again, and while she was waiting for him in the exam room, Lemon blew her nose. To her horror, bright yellow pus was expelled from her nostrils. She expressed to him that she really felt like something was wrong, but Tucker dismissed her concerns by saying she was fine and even accused her of not wanting to get better. After that encounter, Lemon no longer felt comfortable with Tucker, and she even feared that something might be wrong with him. Before she left his practice that day, she made a new appointment, but with a new doctor. When she went to see her new physician, he gave her a proper exam, during which he found a festering piece of gauze that had turned yellow in her nose, purportedly left behind by Dr. Tucker months before. It was this reason that Lemon fought sinus infections and abscesses for weeks. Her nasal cartilage was so damaged as a result of Tucker's treatments that one side of her nose completely collapsed. And one morning, she woke up with cartilage protruding out from her skin. Tucker was the target of malpractice claims from more than a dozen patients. One man visited the doctor for a surgery because his arm was twitching. And, sadly, the procedure went so poorly that his appendage had to be amputated above the elbow since he lost the use of the arm. Tucker vanished while out fishing in June of 1982 as the malpractice lawsuits piled up and a funeral was performed a few days later. A reporter covering hospital illnesses found Tucker was still alive a few years later. But after another 20 years or so, the horrible doctor shot himself, his wife, and their cat, ending all three of their lives. 2. Dr. Death Christopher Dunch was a surgeon in Texas who earned himself the title of a sociopath given to him by his angry colleagues. He would later be called Dr. D, which was short for Dr. Death, as he proved himself to be a clear and present danger to patients. Sadly, one of his victims would be one of his own best friends. Jerry Summers, longtime buddy of Dunch, trusted him to perform his much-needed spinal infusion. But, sadly, Dunch caused massive bleeding during the surgery after he sliced into Summers' spine, hitting one of his major arteries. As a result, Summers was unable to move his arms or legs when he woke up. The man's ability to use his appendages was likely lost due to Dunch's decision to focus on other patients rather than getting scans to determine what was wrong with his friend. The entire incident rendered Summers a quadriplegic. The operation on another patient, Jeff Guildwell, however, ultimately ended Dunch's career. The rest of the surgical team had to physically hold Dunch to prevent him from finishing the procedure because of his bad performance. Dunch gave the family an explanation while Guildwell lay neglected in the intensive care unit for the following two days. Randall Kirby, another surgeon, took over as the lead doctor for the patient. Dunch had completely botched Gilwell's surgery, which horrified Dr. Kirby. He inflicted several serious injuries on the patient, including cuts on his vertebral artery and his throat in the wrong spot. His throat wound was so bad that it had pus and saliva seeping out of it. Then, after an MRI was ordered, it was determined that a sponge had been left in his throat to fester. The Texas Medical Board initiated an investigation after learning about Dunge's history of doing operations incorrectly when Kirby reported him. And in 2013, Dunge's medical license was revoked after it was alleged that he'd injured 33 out of 38 patients. In 2017, he was given a life sentence after being found guilty of purposely hurting his victims. 1. Abduction of Joan Gaycroft Many cities were destroyed and hundreds of lives were lost as an F5 tornado tore across Texas, Oklahoma and Kansas on April 9, 1947. There were 185 deaths and several injuries in one of these communities, Woodward, Oklahoma. Joan Gaycroft and her eight-year-old sister, Gary, who were both residents of Woodward, only suffered minor injuries. But sadly, their mother didn't make it and their father came out of the ordeal with critical injuries. The two young ladies were brought to the neighborhood hospital to reside in the basement, which served as a sanctuary for refugees. Then, two unknown men wearing khaki army uniforms entered the basement sometime during the night and took Joan. 
The men reassured the girl that everything would be well and that they'd come back for Gary when she said that she didn't want to leave her sister. The men said that they were taking Joan to see her family after they were challenged by the hospital staff. But unfortunately, they weren't really questioned all that much and were granted permission to leave with Joan. This, of course, was a bad choice on the hospital's part, as Joan was never seen or heard from again. What's really strange about the whole incident is that everyone thought the men knew Joan because they called out her name when they walked into her room. Throughout the next few decades, the story received national news coverage, but Joan was never found. There were a few leads, though, and in 1999, an editor for the Oklahoma received an email from a woman saying she was Joan. The message also stated she was living under a different identity and that her family was completely aware of it. The woman said she'd like to set up a meeting, but suddenly she stopped communicating with the newspaper and never showed up for the interview. To this day, this puzzling abduction case remains unsolved. If you started seeing a doctor that gave you a bad first impression, would you give them another chance, or would you request a new physician immediately after hearing these stories? Let us know in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one. Bye, guys.